preach at Campus Devo, amen. I, I was over outside, and this guy asked me if I was going to that concert out there. I'm like, what concert? I'm, a, I'm at a good Friday service right there. And, uh, but you're here. And, and that's just awesome that you're here on a Friday night, amen. Fun fact, almost six years ago, um, in a couple weeks, uh, I met Ole. After Easter Sunday, we, oh yeah, like on Sunday, six years, we, he, he met me at a, at a Starbucks. And he taught me how to seek God. And a week later, I got baptized, amen. And, but bro, I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, six years later, you're a super region leader. You're married. You're an evangelist. And I'm preaching at your Devo, amen. Uh, it is Good Friday. Turn with me to Revelation 21. What did Jesus get for us in his coming? Revelation 21, verse 5. The Bible reads, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And the church said, Amen. This is an amazing passage of apocalyptic scripture. And John here is closing out his book of Revelation with yet another heavenly vision. Now we have to understand something. Revelation is, is quite misunderstood mm -hmm. and yeah. misinterpreted. Oh, it is the most misunderstood book in all the Bible. But historically, Revelation was written to the first century church during the reign of the evil emperor Domitian. And it, and it was simple. It was to encourage the disciples, to inspire them, to hold on. That although there was great darkness all around them, although there was great persecution, although many Christians were being put to death and faced martyrdom, that if you don't shrink back from death, if you stay faithful to the end, you will be victorious yeah. and you will win yeah. eternal life. And that was the message of Revelation. And Jesus gave John this vision of hope to give to the church. And John records his vision. And it says that, that one day, life as we know it will all be said and done. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And John records that this city was radiance. It was dazzling, like a bride dressed for her husband. And it says he heard a loud voice heralding the end of an era that God would no longer simply dwell with his people internally, spiritually, but now he would dwell with them literally, physically, and for all eternity, amen? God was finally going to be united with his people once and for all. And it says there's no more death. There's no more mourning. There'd be no more crying, no more tears, and no more pain. Why? Because he said the old order of things has passed away and that God would be making everything new. So the title of my lesson tonight is New World Order, amen? New World Order. It's not what you think, though. My first point is the old order. You know, John writes here that the old order of things, it brought things like death and mourning and crying and pain. Something I believe that we all inherently understand is that the world we live in is very dark. You know, oftentimes when studying the Bible with people, I ask them a, a rhetorical question. Like, do you think the world's a happy place? And, and every, almost every single time, 
no matter their ethnicity, their culture, their background, their profession, whatever it is, they almost always say no. And why is that? Because we all look at the world around us. We look at our childhoods, our upbringings, our lives growing up. And what do we see? Death, mourning, crying, and pain. But Colossians 1.13, it says that this world is a dominion of darkness. And God wants to rescue us from it and bring us into the kingdom of the son he loves. You know, we got to ask ourselves a question. What makes this world so dark? Go to Genesis chapter 6. Go to verse 5. Genesis 6, 5, the Bible reads, It says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Genesis 3, it all started when Adam and Eve disobeyed the word of God by eating the fruit. And they caused sin to enter the previously untainted worlds. And by Genesis chapter 6 now, it says here that the wickedness of man has only increased. And that the magnitude of that was that every inclination, every thought they could possibly think in their heart, it was only evil all the time. The Bible says their wickedness was so great that God himself was grieved. That he had even made them. So much so that shortly after, he simply resigns himself to just wiping it all away with the flood. And starting all over. And I believe that Isaiah 53 verse 6 is very emblematic of this truth. And it says that we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. So what makes the world so dark? It's us. Choosing to follow the sinful desires of our hearts instead of the word of God. Since the beginning of time, we see mankind has always sought to do as they saw fit. We try to live our lives as we please. We somehow think we know best. And the Bible says that Eve ate the fruit. Why? Because it was pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. We learned... That Eve rebelled against God in the garden because she wanted pleasure and she wanted to provide for herself what she felt that God did not give her. She wanted to gain wisdom. We all want wisdom. But she took matters into her own hands. You know, James 1 says that if you want wisdom, you can just ask God for it. Like, like if it's one thing God doesn't want of his people is, is to be stupid. Like, you can be a, a derelict and ask God for wisdom. He's like, I'll make you a smart derelict. Then. But we see that the old order of things was built on the foundation of mankind disobeying God for the sake of their needs and desires. And sadly, the way that the world operates today is no different. You look on campus here at USC, you look over at UCLA, and everyone is in a hot pursuit to fulfill their desires at the cost of disobeying God. And what this produces is a dark world. Because oftentimes, people will rationalize that the ends justify the means. I want this, so I'm willing to do this to get it. That's the world we live in today. You know, we all want things like love and acceptance. But when we turn to worldly relationships and sexual immorality to receive it, what do we get instead? A toxic relationship. A codependent relationship. Where you find your identity in this imperfect person. Right? Cohabitation. I'm not quite sure what, I, what, what we are, but we're living together, but we're together, but we're not. We're together, but we're not. Cohabitation. Insecurity. Cheating. Lack of trust. STDs. Abuse. Unwanted pregnancies. Abortions. Destroyed marriages. Destroyed homes. You see, we want stability and comfort, but when we worship worldly success and money to receive it, what do we get instead? A continual lust for more. Yeah. 
You never feel satisfied. Right? You never feel at peace. You can never truly enjoy what your hands build. You always want more, right? You always want the newest and the next best thing. And then you find yourself climbing a corporate ladder and being subject to the cruelty of a cold consumer-based system. We all want peace and joy. But when we indulge in worldly pleasures to achieve it, what do we get instead? Addiction to drugs, alcohol. How many of, did that, how many of us does that describe, right? Addiction to Addiction to, to all these different things, STDs, depression, yeah. mental illness and antidepressants being used at an all-time high. Yeah. But you see something is that we have all these basic human needs, but we'll often turn to ungodly means yeah. to fulfill wow. them. Wow. And we reap what we sow. On, this Chris. is the world we live in today. Yeah. This on, is the on. old order. Let's go, Chris. Oh, you know, there was a, a tragic story of a young man, uh, 22 years of age, named Elliot Rogers. You don't know his story. Uh, he earned himself the name the Virgin Killer. And there was one thing that Elliot wanted more than anything in his life, and that was romance. He wanted one true love. He wanted a romantic and sexual relationship. He just wanted a girlfriend. And to Elliot's disappointment, he, he never had success in this area, and he became embittered. More and more throughout the years, he began to hate men that he felt threatened by and women he was rejected by. And soon, Elliot was filled with rage, hatred, and violence. And he vowed to make the world feel what he's been feeling inside for so long. Come on, bro. Sadly, uh, May 23rd, 2014, he went on a, a stabbing and shooting spree. He killed six people and injured 14 others wow. with what became known as the Isla Vista killings. And to think that Elliot's initial desire to be loved and accepted warped into an evil that brought death, mourning, crying, and pain to everyone around him because he sought fulfillment in all the wrong ways. Wow. You see, this world is a dark place. Yeah. This world has nothing for you. But see, that is not who God is. That is not who we have to be. It says that God wants to fulfill the desires of your hearts with good things. He wants you to find that husband. He wants you to find that wife. He wants to give you all that you need so you don't have to worry. And you don't have to feel like I got to go behind his back to get what I want. You see, it's true. It is we who can make the world a dark place. We can become slaves to our desires, but if we're the problem, we can also be the solution. See, we don't have to make the world a dark place. We can actually be the light of the world. And I look at this room right here. I see discontented people, men and women, sick of the old order, the way that the world is being ran, and our belt on helping God create something new. Come on, My challenge for the disciples is simple. We need to work hard. Yeah. We need to work unified, and we need to work smart. See, I don't know if USC is a quarter system, but for UCLA, <laughs> we're a quarter system Amen. right here. And what happened before spring break is done. Yeah. Consider that the old order. Yeah. And we need to any back up yeah. and get our ministries moving Come again. On, I believe sharing is happening. I believe Bible studies are happening. Right. And I believe many of us are in a place to get effective. Yeah. Something I want to challenge us with is we need to humble ourselves. Ooh. Learn from each other, play to each other's strengths, because there are those frustrated souls who are stuck in the old order. And it's up to us to get them out, amen? Let's go to Hebrews 9. Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. Fire it up. Hebrews 9, amen. A little bit somber. Let's, let's hope it picks up. Hebrews 9, verse 6. Awesome, bro. The Bible reads: Come on. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer court to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room. And that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself 
and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. My second point is the new order. Amen? And I know this can seem like a complicated and obscure passage of scripture, but we're going to break it down together. Amen? Now, historically, we have the old covenant, right? The Levitical law. If you don't know, this was a highly complex and meticulous and arduous religion that served one simple purpose, was to allow men to be in a sustainable and cohesive relationship with God. So we know God is a consuming fire, and that sin separates us from God. So God, in his grace, created a way for him to live among his sinful people without smiting them. Amen? The heart of God was always to live with his people. Amen? Got to love God. Amen? Uh, so they had a physical tabernacle and a physical temple in which they ministered. And they offered sacrifices that, so that they would be forgiven by God. But one chapter prior in Hebrews 8, 7, it says that there was something wrong with this covenant, though. You see, the forgiveness was only temporary. They had to offer these sacrifices again and again and again and again simply for God to live among them. Wow. But then the scripture says these external practices, they only applied until the time of the new order, which is the new covenant, Christianity that was built on better promises. So I want to congratulate you. If you're a disciple and you found the kingdom, welcome to the new world order, amen. We have better promises. It's a better deal here. We don't got to kill anything to pray to God. We don't got to kill anything to have a quiet time. It's terrible. Blood everywhere. Killing goats. It's like really makes you take your sins seriously. What they had to go through back in the day. I'm a Christian, amen. Uh, but something you have to understand is that the old covenant was not God's solution to the old order. You with me right there? Because the Bible says the sacrifice is made, it couldn't cleanse your conscience. It didn't cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. So what we conclude is that Levitical law didn't offer personal transformation. You see, it could not change the hearts of men and women and keep them faithful to the end. Amen. Hebrews 3 teaches that most of the Israelites perished because they had a sinful, unbelieving heart. So we need to have a deep conviction on conviction, conviction, conviction on something that simply being religious. It was never able to save you. And it didn't. Man, like somehow exclude you from the old order. Yeah. Simply believing in God, going to church, and fundamentally getting to live however you wanted wow. did not get you to heaven. Wow. You see, we need to be transformed yeah. right there. We need to become new creations. Yeah. We need the new order, yeah. which is a new covenant of Jesus Christ that can actually change the hearts of men and women, and in turn, change the whole world. Wow. We need to restore yeah. true Christianity in our generation. Are you with me, church? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to talk quickly uh, about New Testament conversion, if that's OK. Let's talk quickly about New Testament conversion. Uh, Take a drink. This is my favorite topic to preach on. I talk about it a lot. And uh, I understand we live in a day and age where there are so many denominations and versions of Christianity. It's not even funny. I know we kind of poke fun. It's not even funny. It's like exasperating. Right? It takes like a few days to convert one person. As opposed to back in the day, it was like, boom. You're right. I'm going, yeah. I got to repent. Amen? But 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, it predicted that such a time as this would come, where there will be a, a, a great age of many teachers who will teach all different kinds of doctrines and interpretations. 
I read 2 Peter 2 for my quiet time the other day, and, and it was so sobering. Peter warns us, 2 Peter 2, that there, it's not like there might be. He said there will be false teachers among you. And he says they would poison the church from within. And it's not like these guys would be picketers who barely made an impact. Peter says they would have a great impact. They would be fruitful in their false ministry. So God in his grace through Peter gives us descriptions of how to identify them. Amen? Amen. But I think we can forget that the meticulous God of the Levitical law, he's the same God of Christ's law. Yeah. You with me right there? Yeah. So in the same way there was one way, one pattern of doing things in the old covenant, it's the same with Christianity. Right. Something we have to have a deep conviction about. That's easy to understand, but it's hard to accept because of the implications. Yeah. Is that there's one pattern of sound teaching. There's one way of salvation, and there's only one way to convert. Yeah, I've been in a lot of Bible studies in my time, and people, they're like, no, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. I'm like, so are you willing to say that if you don't have it, that person's going to hell? They're like, well, I mean, after all, there's grace, amen? God knows, and then you see what they really believe. You see what they really set their feet on. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Just to mystify it really quick. Acts 2. You know, uh, coming up in, in the kingdom, anytime Oli preached, he would throw Acts 2 in there. And I was like, I'm going to throw Acts 2 in there. It says in verse 36. If you don't know, this is the inaugural service of the church. This is the first time the gospel was ever preached. And the Bible says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So that's the gospel, is that you killed Jesus. And then verse 37, it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on. And so, something that is unique about our church is that we have deep convictions. That you don't, it's not a suggestion that you should repent. You actually have to repent. Yeah. It's a fine line right there. People are like, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. I'm like, do you believe that I should or have to? They're like, well, if you really believed, you will. I'm like, no, 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 no. So you're trying to answer the question without having to answer the question. Right? But we have deep convictions that we need to know what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus and get baptized in order to be saved. And I understand that not many people share this conviction. I want to share with you something at this time that I hope intrigues you. Studying it out, and I learned something cool. You know, John 3.3, 3, Jesus tell Nicod tells Nicodemus that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So it's pretty important, right? right. Salvational issue. Would you agree? Yeah. In Mark 10.15, it says that you must become like a little child to receive the kingdom of God. So you pair those two scriptures, and it teaches that to be born again means to become like a little child, right? Wow. Then in Matthew 18, verse 3, it says that unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So being born again and becoming like a child means to change. Yeah. What's interesting is that the word change in Matthew 18 can also be translated to unless you are converted. Whoa. It says, unless you are converted Ooh. and become like a little child. On, the Greek word here is strefo. I hope I pronounced it right. And strefo means to turn, to turn around, to change one's mind. That reminds me of Acts 2, where the Greek word for repent is metanoia, which also means to change one's mind, to turn. So biblically speaking, being born again and becoming like a child directly translates to changing 
changing your mind, being converted, turning to God. Being born again biblically means to repent. But then in Matthew 28, Jesus says that you got to be made into a disciple. You must be converted. So unless you're born again, which means to repent and become a true disciple, you will never see the kingdom of God. So try to tell me that you don't have to repent in order to be saved, and we're going to have a problem, amen? Amen. But this is the new order. Why? Because in order to change the world, you must change the human heart. And faith alone never changed the human heart. It was a great movie. Who likes Mark Wahlberg? What the heck? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he had a, it was a, there's a great movie named Shooter. Right? Great movie, right? Amen. But he plays a character named Bob Lee Swagger, and, and he was a, a Marine sniper, right? Uh, who leaves the military after uh, the last mission he was on went bad. And so the beginning of the movie, Swagger goes off the grid to live a quiet life in the mountains. Actually sounds really nice. We gotta evangelize the world that way, man. But eventually, some public, uh, some high profile, rather, uh, government official, they find him with their resources and their espionage, and they persuade him to work a top secret mission that supposedly was meant to thwart a plot against the president. Well, as the movie goes on, it, it turns out that they set him up, surprise. Uh, as a scapegoat in an assassina- assassination attempt. Wow. And the whole movie is uh, about his crusade to not only prove himself innocent, but take down the corrupt organization behind it all. And there was a, a scene where he's tracking down the main antagonist, Colonel Johnson. And he's interrogating one of the villains. His name is Serbiak. He was also a sniper for, I believe, the Russian military. And the scene goes as follows. Swiger asks, well, who runs Johnson? Serbiak, a senator from Montana, I think. You don't get it. There is no head to cut off. It's a conglomerate. If one of them betrays the principles of the accrual of money and power, the others betray him. What it is, is human weakness. And you can't kill that with a gun. And how true it is. See, it's the, the wickedness of our hearts. The, the, the human weakness that the old order thrives on. Wow. And Jesus Christ came to bring a new world order, yeah. a new way of life yeah. that won't just change the actions of people through religion, but it'll change their heart through a true biblical conversion. Wow. And that's how we're going to change the world. When men and women repent, become true disciples, yeah. and are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and go off to teach others how to do the same. If you are a guest visiting tonight, I want to challenge you to study the Bible with the person who brought you out and study out New Testament conversion. If you're a disciple, I want to challenge you. In what ways have you begun to conform to the old order again? We look, we know our ministries fairly well. Maybe it's a lack of commitment among some of us. Maybe it's shallow convictions on sound doctrine and being sentimental with your friends and family who aren't disciples. Maybe you're looking back and you're mourning your cost, what you had to give up. Maybe it's pride that makes you critical and untrusting toward the disciples because you think you know best and how things should be run. Maybe it's selfish ambition. Good old selfish ambition. Or insecurity about your place in the ministry. Maybe you can find yourself struggling in your heart towards certain disciples because you're clinging to a position or you feel threatened by them. Maybe it's unrepentant or willful sin in your life. I want to challenge you to search your heart of these things and share with the disciple you know that needs to hear it and walk in the light, amen? Let's be done with the old order of things.
which only brought spiritual death, mourning, crying, and pain. You see, the world is waiting on us, the children of God, to be revealed. There's a funny video that says, we're the sons of God of the earth. And they're waiting for us to bring the fight to the devil so they can have the new order in their lives. Are you with me, church? My third and final point is order up. Amen? We're going to 2 Peter 3. Verse 8. The Bible reads, says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are all looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with wow. him. Mm. Come on. Peter says here that the only reason Jesus hasn't returned yet is because God is patient. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And he wants everyone to have a chance to repent. Yeah. Yeah. He wants as many as possible yeah. to escape the fire that's coming. But Peter says there's going to be a time where the patience runs out. Wow. The challenging part is we don't know when that is. The only clue that we get is that it's going to come like a thief. Meaning what? Suddenly, without warning, and when you least expect it. You see, Jesus' return holds the element of surprise, so that calls us to stand watch and to stay ready. He says that since everything is going to be incinerated in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? We need to make every effort to be holy, godly. Blameless, spotless, and at peace with him. Come on. I believe that a lie we can tell ourselves, family, is that we have time. What? I'll study the Bible later. Yeah. This is something I want to do when I'm older. Real, this is something I want to pass on to my kids. I was studying the Bible a few weeks ago with a guy, and he says, yeah, this is something I want to uh, do later when I have kids. Wow. Like, pass on to your kids. You're not even doing it. <laughs> you ever heard that one before? Yeah. Or this, I'll repent later. I'll deal with my heart later. No. I'll forgive and be family later. No. No. <laughs> See, we have a decision to make family. Yeah. Stay subject to the old order and be destroyed with it. Or repent now. Come on. Change now and choose the new order. Like Luke 14 says, think hard. Yeah. You've got to count the cost. Yeah. But don't think too long. Yeah. Because the second king of 20K is still a long way off. You know, one day, God's going to ring that bell, and your order will be up. And it'll be time to eat what you chose. You know, there's a story in our church of a young man who once studied the Bible. I believe, um, to be mistaken, that he was the son of a disciple who was, uh, you know, going nowhere with his life, sadly. And he was uh, addicted to drugs. And, and everyone, including himself, he's like, unless I change... Um, I wouldn't survive this life. Well, he starts studying the Bible, and uh, the studies go well. Right? He studies discipleship. He decides that I want to become a disciple, and I know what I have to give up. I have to give up this life of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Well, he finished studying the Bible. He, he counts the cost, and uh, the morning came for him to be baptized, and um, wasn't picking up his phone. Brothers were unable to reach him. He didn't return their calls, and and they heard nothing from him. And later on, after some discovery, it turns out that that a little bit before, I think the night before, 
He decided that since I'm going to give up everything and become a disciple, I'm just going to use one more time for old time's sake. And sadly, that young man overdosed and sadly lost his life. You know, that's a, a tragic story that I believe that we need to heed warning from. Yeah. But I also want to encourage you with the story of a young disciple. Her name was Deja Robinson. Whoa! Yeah. Come on, Christophe. Deja Robinson was only a disciple for like a year and a half. Yeah. She got baptized in the, the, the quarantine. And if anyone knows Deja, she wasted no time. Yeah. She was one of the few disciples where she was discipled to take a rest. Yeah. And every waking moment, as long as she was breathing, she was sharing her faith. Yeah. She was the, the birthday deaconess, making cards for all the birthdays and the birthdays. Wow. She was in Bible studies. She was sending brothers phone numbers of men she shared with. And... There was one night where we were having a Berkeley family time, and Deja and I were singing Never Say Never by Justin Bieber. Nice. Singing karaoke. Great song. And uh, we were killing it, amen? That's awesome, bro. Singing our hearts out. That's awesome, bro. And no one ever expected that just two days later, God was like, that's enough. It's time for you to come home. And it was so like, Man, what happened? I was just singing Justin Bieber with her. And uh, it inspired us, though. That year, we had the, the theme for our campus campaign, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Deja. Yeah. You see, family, you can choose who you're going to be. You can think you have time. Or you can understand that I don't have much. If you're here tonight, I would encourage you to be the latter. You know, anytime we tell ourselves, family, that we have time to change, we're lying to ourselves. The truth is, there is no time. We only have right now. I believe if you're here tonight, you want to change. And I believe that you can. Yeah, I want to inspire you that you are one decision away from taking hold of all the promises this book has to offer. Come on, Christoph, let's go. The Bible says that this old order yeah. will be absolutely obliterated on, by fire yeah. one day. Mm. And that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, Come on. the home of righteousness, yeah. where we will live with God. On, and that's not going to be a place where instead of being known of how great man's wickedness has become, it will be a place known for how great and abundant God's righteousness yeah. is. This is a land we're all going, my brothers and sisters. I want to challenge us. Let's be done with the old order. And let's make a decision to join the new world order. And to God be the glory. Yeah.